mentioning um, yesterday that it's been 10 years since we hosted a, a similar conference on quantum field theory. And if you look at the literature on philosophy of quantum field theory in the past 10 years, it's really virgin. There's been an awful lot that's going on. But another thing that happened has been get, it's gotten really confusing because you see reference lists and, and that say things like Fraser D and Fraser J D and, and people say Fraser says this but Fraser says this. So anyways, um, mm. know your Frasers. Keep them clean. <laughs> KD Fraser is not the same person as D Fraser in case mm. that's not completely obvious to you here. <laughs> Um, okay, so James uh, um, Fraser is going to talk about rethinking perturbation theory in the 1950s. Okay, so yeah, so thanks to all the organizers for inviting me. It's been really good so far. Um, yeah, so if you, um, if you looked at the abstract, you might have noticed that uh, Michael Miller and I are both giving talks on um, this causal perturbation theory approach. And the reason for that is that, yeah, we're, we're working on a on a project together with Alexander Bloom on this approach. Um, so basically, yeah, our talks are based on different facets of the same very in-progress paper that we're working on. Um, and yeah, so how that came about, yeah, I should say something about the, uh, the project and how it came about. Um, so basically, I, I was in uh, the Max Planck Institute uh, for the History of Science working with Alexander Bloom, and we were looking at um, some of these early papers in the 1950s which introduced the notion of the renormalization group. Yeah, so that I was trying to figure out kind of what was going on there historically. And we realized that these papers were um, operating in the context of this kind of fairly obscure causal perturbation theory uh, program. Uh, and I knew that Mike had been giving some talks about kind of the philosophical implications of the contemporary um, manifestation of this causal perturbation theory program in mathematical physics. So we, we started talking and thought, yeah, it would make sense to write a paper together that kind of integrates the, the history of, the, uh, of this approach with um, the philosophy of physics implications. So I'm going to be focusing on the, the historical side in this talk, and especially on um, the emergence of the causal perturbation theory framework in the 1950s in the work of uh, Stockerberg and uh, Bogolubov. Um, but I'm going to be, yeah, trying to keep it um, still also interesting for philosophical discussions and, and the, the theme of the conference, the, the foundations of quantum field theory. So I'll be focusing on two foundational issues which are kind of illuminated by this work in the 1950s. In particular, um, the question of how we should understand the relationship between um, perturbative quantum field theory and non-perturbative quantum field theory and um, the issue of how we should understand the problem of ultraviolet divergences in the perturbation series and the, the renormalization procedure. Okay, so the, the plan for, for what I'm going to say, I'll, I'll start off um, in the first part by um, just briefly going over the, the conventional approach to setting up perturbative quantum field theory um, and raising two kind of problems with this approach, which essentially map onto the two foundational themes which I just mentioned. Um, and then I will talk about this alternative way of setting up the perturbation series, the perturbative expansion based on a, on a causality condition. Um, uh, and talk about, yeah, some, some morals we could draw from this, this approach. And then in the last part, I'll talk about um, how renormalization was handled in this, in this causal perturbation theory approach in the 1950s. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about um, the emergence of the renormalization group in this context, but I don't really have that much on that yet. Okay. Okay, so the, the conventional approach to um, perturbative quantum field theory. So the, the, um, the basic object that we're trying to get at in um, perturbative QFT in general is the S matrix, which is this uh, object which maps um, asymptotic states um, at t, t is minus infinity to outgoing states at t is infinity. And the, the standard approach to setting up um, a perturbative expansion for the S matrix um, starts off with uh, a time evolution equation in the, in the interaction picture. So basically how this works is that um, the Hamiltonian of, of the quantum field theory you're trying to treat is split into a, a free and interacting part. And, um, 
the states are taken to evolve under the interaction Hamiltonian alone, um, with the remainder of the time evolution being shifted into the, into the field operators. We then write down an equation for the interaction picture, um, type, yeah, the, inter the interaction picture time evolution operator, um, which looks something like this. And um, this is then uh, kind of iteratively integrated to, to yield a, a series expansion um, for this time evolution operator. And then we take the, the asymptotic limits of um, the initial and final times going to infinity. Um, and this gives us an expression for the S matrix. Uh, yeah, so here the, uh, the T is the, the kind of standard time order product symbol, which um, orders these products so that the earlier time arguments are to the right and the later time arguments to the left. Okay, um, so the, 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 what, the reason that we work in the, in the interaction picture is that uh, taking these incoming asymptotic states, incoming and outgoing asymptotic states to be uh, eigenstates of the free Hamiltonian, um, this stuff here, um, we can write that down as um, uh, Fox space operators acting on the free vacuum, so stuff we know how to calculate. At least in principle, the calculations are going to get more and more difficult as we go to higher and higher orders in the, in the perturbation series. Um, but yeah, the idea is that we can try and calculate um, the S matrix elements of a full interacting theory using what we know about free, exactly solvable free quantum field theories. Okay, so that's the, the conventional approach to setting up the perturbation series for the S matrix. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna flag kind of two um, two worries about this, this way of doing things. Um, one is the, the problem of multiple divergences and renormalization. So this was obviously historically the, um, the most pressing problem with this, with this framework, which is that um, starting from second order in the series, the, the so-called Dyson series, which is the, the expression I had written up before, um, the integrals in that series don't converge. In particular, they, they blow up in the, the ultraviolet, um, so like the, the region of high momentum or small distances. Um, and yeah, the great kind of success of the late 19, 1940s was um, the introduction of this renormalization procedure, which allowed um, empirical predictions to still be extracted from, from the Dyson series. And the way this works is, yeah, it's essentially a three-step process. Um, you start off by introducing a regulator, which um, renders the, the diverging integrals convergent. And the, yeah, the conceptually simplest way of doing this is to impose a, um, a high momentum cutoff on the integrals. Then the dynamical pro, um, parameters of the model are redefined so as to absorb the diverging parts into um, so-called bare parameters. Um, so counter terms are introduced and Finally, after this, um, we know the second step has been formed, we can remove the regulator and we now have a, a finite limit and we have finite predictions. And indeed, these end up being like some of the most accurate predictions um, in the history of physics. Um, yeah, so while the renormalization um, procedure resolves the issue of ultraviolet divergences from a practical perspective, it allows us to get these really accurate empirical predictions out of perturbative quantum field theory. Um, conceptual puzzles remained about how we should really understand what's going on here. It wasn't obvious why ultraviolet divergences occur in the first place and what their physical significance was, uh, and also what the physical basis for the, the kind of renormalization procedure was, essentially. So what justified the, very, the, the steps that go into the renormalization procedure. Uh, yeah, so there's a worry that this is kind of an ad hoc move. And then on the mathematical side, um, the way that renormalization was, was um, being carried out by um, physicists uh, did seem to involve the manipulation of these ill-defined integrals, um, calling into question like the rigor um, and validity of, of the manipulations involved. So in the, in the last part of the talk, um, we'll see that the causal perturbation theory approach um, sheds some light on these, these issues about um, the, the problem of ultraviolet divergences and how we should understand renormalization uh, in the context of perturbative quantum field theory. Okay, uh, so the second problem, though, is um, more to do with the, the starting point for the conventional perturbative QFT approach, and that's the interaction picture time evolution equation. 
Um, so the way that this is written down, the way that this is used in the conventional derivation of the perturbation series, the, the time evolution equation really has a quite a formal character. In principle, it's, it's, it involves free states, free asymptotic states to um, inter states of the interacting theory at finite times, but we only really use the information about the, the asymptotic states. Um, we don't even really know how to write down uh, states and operators of the full interacting theory. So we don't really, yeah, we can't kind of flesh in the time evolution between the asymptotic times. And we're still, Haag's theorem um, is taken to show that, that the time evolution operator of the interaction picture um, operating at finite times just can't actually exist. Um, the reason being that um, the free, a free and fully interacting um, quantum field theory, their, their Hamiltonians are associated with unitarily and equivalent Hilbert spaces, so it's just not possible uh, for there to be a unitary operator linking the eigenstates of the, of the free theory to the states of the full interacting theory. Um, yeah. So the conventional derivation of the perturbation series seems to be based on quite shaky foundations. Um, and this, and this, this question of where we should start in setting up the, perturb the perturbative expansion of the S matrix was um, what the, the architects of the causal perturbation theory program were, were really concerned with in the beginning. While they weren't directly responding to Haag's theorem, so that, that came somewhat later and it's not even clear whether, um, yeah, whether Stuckelberg and Bukhlebuff were ever aware of, of this result. Um, they, they shared an intuition that the dynamical framework being employed in the conventional derivation was somehow um, problematic um, and that a different starting point was, was needed or was possible. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about this, this alternative way of setting up the perturbation <coughs> series, which Stuckelberg and Bigelow were, were working on in the 1950s. Yeah, so Stuckelberg was the, 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 origi the, the, the origin of this uh, alternative causal approach to, to setting up the, the perturbative expansion of the S matrix. And he was really drawing on um, Heisenberg's S matrix program during the war. Heisenberg had introduced um, the notion of the S matrix. And the idea seems to have been that um, we could, Heisenberg's hope was that we could just kind of construct S matrices by imposing conditions on them, like uh, Lorentz, Lorentz covariance and unitarity. Um, Stuckelberg's idea um, was that causality, a causality condition could act as a kind of further demand on the S matrix. Um, and yeah, so he's now dealing explicitly with um, the S matrix expanded in a perturbation series, which wasn't Heisenberg's original idea. Um, so in this early paper in, in 1944, Stuckelberg, this is the, where Stuckelberg first started talking about causality considerations. Uh, Stuckelberg observed that expanding the, uh, one of Heisenberg's ansatzes for the S matrix in, in a perturbation series gave rise to um, terms which he identified as containing an A-causal component. So the, I'm kind of, Stuckelberg's very difficult to understand what he's, he's <laughs> saying a lot of the time, uh, including the equations he writes down. So I'm kind of using uh, Alex's reconstruction of what Stuckelberg's saying in this paper. Um, where's my, yeah, okay. So um, yeah, the issue seems to have been that we can kind of decompose these, if we just expand this, uh, in a series expansion, we get terms like this, which we can decompose into one component uh, here, which corresponds to a kind of normal causal process, and this component here, which is which Stuckelberg interpreted as as corresponding to um, a particle being created at a later time t and then annihilated at an earlier time t. So a kind of like retro causal process. Um, and this was what Stuckelberg identified as a kind of violation of causality in the perturbation series. So the, the, the hope was that what was needed uh, was a kind of criterion which would allow us to eliminate these A-causal contributions to the series. Um, and Stuckelberg never really succeeded in um, giving a, a very clear, um, giving a very clear causality condition, but the best that he, he managed essentially um, go something like this. He, he argued that um, if we just take an arbitrary um, series expansion um, of uh, free field operators, they can be decomposed into two-point propagators. Um, 
And the way that he imposed causality was to require that all of the two-point propagators, which you, which the uh, series, comp um, the terms in the series are decomposed into, have a have a, a causal form. Um, so, in the case of a of a scalar a scalar theory, um, this the the thing that he wrote down he defined as the causal form of the propagator was something like this, which is basically what's called the the Feynman propagator in in conventional uh, perturbative quantum field theory. Um, and apparently, he was able to argue that um, just making this demand that the that the the series is decomposable into causal propagators um, could uh, reproduce the first few terms of the Dyson series, so could reproduce the, the, the form of the perturbation series, which was known to be empirically um, very successful. So yeah, there were two main problems. Well, as far as I'm concerned, there are two main problems with, with Stuckelberg's uh, first attempt to set up the perturbation series using a causality condition. Um, on the one hand, yeah, Stuckelberg's presentation of the causality issue relied on a, a physical interpretation of the individual terms in the perturbation series as somehow corresponding to um, processes. Uh, so it, yeah, it has a somewhat murky physical motivation. It doesn't really have any kind of non-perturbative foundation. Um, and he also, yeah, ultimately failed to give a precise mathematical formulation of the causality condition uh, or to show that the whole Dyson series could be could be reproduced um, in this alternative uh, this, in this alternative way of deriving the series. Yeah, so Stuckelberg's work was was mostly ignored essentially, um, but one person who who was listening uh, was um, this Soviet mathematical physicist or mathematician turned physicist. Uh, Nikolai Bogolubov, so he kind of took up Schuckelberg's ideas and um, developed them, made them more coherent, essentially. Um, yeah, so Bogolubov's, um, in, in, a, in a trio of papers in 1951 and 1952, Bogolubov's initial um, entrance into quantum field theory, essentially, he was trying to, he was exploring the, um, the time evolution equation, the quantum field theory time evolution equation, um, and was dissatisfied with the, with the formal character of, of that equation, the way that it was employed in the, in the standard perturbative formalism. So he was essentially exploring the possibility of trying to um, derive the time evolution, a time evolution equation from, um, from the, the perturbative expansion of the S matrix. So essentially turning the Dyson, Dysonian derivation in the in the opposite direction and starting off with a perturbation series and getting back to the time evolution equation. And this led him to consider um, generalizing the S matrix to describe scattering events at finite times rather than just asymptotic states. Stuckelberg had also um, considered this problem of describing scattering at finite times. Um, and the, 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 the formalism he introduced for this was, yeah, so in, in order to continue working with eigenstates of the free theory, he introduced this so-called switching function, um, yeah, which I'm calling GX, which um, turns the interaction on and off in some finite region of space-time. So it's essentially like taking the coupling to be, um, to depend on, on time and space and just turning it on in some, in some region, in some finite region. Um, so Stuckelberg argued that um, this was, yeah, so this is kind of an aside, really. Um, but yeah, so Stuckelberg argued that taking this, this switching function to be discontinuous, like a box function or something, um, would act, which, yeah, which he thought would be needed to recover a differential, um, a differential time evolution equation. So I guess the thinking is you, you essentially need to um, yeah, you need to discontinuously turn on and off um, the interaction in order to treat um, time evolution of infinitesimally close times or something. Uh, yeah, so Stuckelberg argued that do, trying to do that, trying to turn on the interaction discontinuously um, led to these so-called surface divergences, so a new type of divergences in the perturbation series. Um, so this was part of his, his argument for preferring the causal, the causal derivation of the perturbation series over the conventional um, Dysonian one, because the yeah the claim was supposed to be 
yeah, we just can't get back to a time evolution equation from the perturbation series. Trying to do that um, leads to a new type of divergence which can't be renormalized. So both Stuckel and Bugelabuff seems to just accept this argument uh, and develops it slightly. Um, yeah, so the, the, um, the solution to this issue essentially is that we need to take these, uh, the switching function to be a smooth function which turns, turns on the interaction and turns it off uh, smoothly in some finite region of, of uh, space-time. So yeah, now from then on, these GXs are taken to be smooth functions and Bugalabov wrote down a general series expansion for the S matrix in this form. So this is just taking these SNs to be currently arbitrary um, factors. Um, and yeah, the, the idea is that when we impose a causality condition, it's going to restrict the form of the perturbation series and hopefully recover um, the successful empirical predictions of the conventional approach. Um, the, the, really, the important issue with these, with these switching functions was that um, Bugalabov uh, used the switching functions to formulate a new version of the causality condition, um, which, is, yeah, which was better than what Stuckelberg had managed to come up with. Um, the idea was that we should, uh, to consider decomposing um, a, one of the, a switching function into two parts, G1 and G2, um, which have support in two, in two regions, big G1 and big G2. Um, where all the points in G1 are in the past with respect to some reference frame and all the points in G2 are in the future with respect to that reference frame. So this is just a drawing in, in one dimension. Um, and then the causality condition was written down in this form. So essentially the effect of, uh, we can decompose um, the effect of the scattering of this kind of combined switching function into two parts. Um, and the interpretation of this, of this causality condition was that um, the effects of scattering, um, of scattering in an earlier, uh, an earlier time, G1, are independent of a later period of scattering in G2. So this is supposed to rule out the kind of a-causal um, processes which Stuckelberg had originally been worrying about. And the cool thing about this condition is that uh, it does actually give quite a nice way of deriving the, the basic form of the, the standard Dyson series. So, yeah, if we just plug uh, Bugalabov's um, kind of way of, of writing down a general series expansion into this causality condition um, and do some uh, rearranging of the terms, you can get um, this, this equality. So these are, these are equal because of the causality condition. Um, and this allows you to essentially decompose um, one of the terms, uh, a higher term in the perturbation series can be decomposed into a product of lower terms in the perturbation series. And Bugalabov then argued that the first term in the perturbation series has to be equal to the, uh, yeah, equivalent to the uh, interaction Hamiltonian on kind of correspondence grounds. And if we, if we, yeah, once we have S1 using this kind of formula, we can actually iteratively construct the, the higher terms in the series. And yeah, essentially you get, you get the, um, the standard, um, this is the, the thing that was being integrated over in the, in the standard Dyson series. So the, the time ordered product of, um, a product of uh, the interaction Hamiltonians. So yeah, this, this um, Bugalovus version of the causality condition was, has at least a clearer, um, in principle it's a non-perturbative condition and has a clearer physical motivation and was able to um, recover the form of the Dyson series. Okay, so in terms of, uh, yeah, so we saw at the in terms of the, the morals at this stage of, the, of um, this first stage of development essentially, we saw that um, the conventional derivation of the Dyson series was based on, on uh, this dubious uh, interaction picture time evolution equation. And one interesting feature of this, this alternative way of setting up uh, the perturbation series is that, yeah, Bugalabov had essentially showed that um, we can actually derive the basic form of the Dyson series without employing a time evolution equation at all. Rather, we can start from this causality condition. And this is arguably, a, given the, these worries about the inconsistency of the time evolution equation coming from Hagg's theorem, 
this is arguably a conceptually cleaner way of setting up uh, perturbative quantum field theory. Um, it also makes more minimal assumptions, uh, non-perturbative assumptions, I guess, than the, the standard derivation. Um, it, yeah, it doesn't posit this kind of dynamical framework which seems to be in conflict with um, Haag's theorem. Yeah, I was going to say something else about the, um, the, the kind of context um, of, this, of this causal approach uh, in the 1950s and debates about the, the foundations of quantum field theory and, yeah, this question of the relationship between um, perturbative QFT and non-perturbative QFT. So, yeah, I think causal, this, this initial wave of the causal perturbation theory program has quite an interesting place in the, in the broader context of debates about the foundations of QFT in the 1950s. So besides, yeah, I raised two worries about the conventional, um, the conventional approach to, con to perturbative quantum field theory, but there were also kind of concerns about the consistency of QED and even QFT as a whole in this period. Um, so kind of worries about the non-perturbative foundations of the theory. And one response to this, this, uh, this kind of um, situation in the 1950s was to uh, associate it especially with the axiomatic QFT program was to think, right, we need to try and put quantum field theory on a firm non-perturbative footing, uh, and then maybe we can, we can get going in trying to explain the, um, uh, explain the success of the, of the um, empirical results derived from the, from the perturbation series. Stuckelberg and Bogolubov, uh, well, yeah, so one interesting way of thinking about what's going on here is that Stuckelberg and Bogolubov are really could be understood as taking the opposite strategy of essentially uh, kind of jettisoning these, uh, the non-perturbative side of quantum field theory, um, quarantining these worries about the non-perturbative foundations, uh, and trying to develop perturbative quantum field theory as an independent um, framework and making it more internally coherent on its own terms, essentially. Okay, so yeah, so that's, that's all I was gonna say about the, the causal construction. Um, yeah, so I'll now move on to talk about um, renormalization in this, in this um, causal perturbation theory approach. So from the start, the, the causal perturbation theory program was associated with a different interpretation of the, the problem of ultraviolet divergences. Um, and how, yeah, and the renormalization, the issue of renormalization. So ultraviolet divergences can be seen as, as arising from singularities in the, in the propagators at coincident space-time points. So when we take um, the two arguments of the propagators to be um, the same point, we get these singularities in the, in the form of the propagator. Um, but since causality condition, considerations um, concern the temporal ordering of events, um, they don't seem to tell us anything about these um, coincident points, essentially. So, yeah, causality um, conditions shouldn't restrict what's happening at, at coincident points, or this was, the, this was the thought. So this led both Stuckelberg and Bogolubov to, to view the products of propagators in the perturbation series, rather than viewing them as divergent and in need of renormalization, um, they viewed them instead as being ambiguously defined at coincident points. So the issue of, of uh, ultraviolet divergences was transformed in an issue of ambiguity uh, at, yeah, at these coincident points, which um, the causality condition couldn't um, fix the unique form of, essentially. So yeah, we can see this when, as I said, in, in the causal perturbation theory approach, the, the perturbation series is constructed iteratively. So you start off with, um, um, yeah, your first term, and then you can construct the higher terms in the series using the causality condition. Um, but yeah, when, when you're constructing the next, the next term in the series, you can actually add um, additional terms which, which vanish everywhere except at coincident space-time points without violating this uh, causality condition which Bogolubov had written down. So, yeah, at second order, for instance, um, you, you've got your, your first term in the series. Um, this is, this is the, the standard form of the Dyson series, the Dyson term. Um, and then you can also add this additional term here, um, which is 
basically some series of delta functions and derivatives of delta functions. So it's going to be something which vanishes everywhere except when x1 and x2, x1 equals x2, so at the coincident uh, point. Um, and more generally, as we progress through the series, we're apparently going to need to fix um, uh, one of these, what Bugalabov calls them quasi-local terms, quasi-local operators, um, at each order as we progress um, in iteratively constructing the series. Um, and in some sense, these, these um, additional terms are taken to correspond to, uh, correspond in some sense to the, the counter terms which are introduced in the conventional renormalization procedure. Or maybe more accurately, they, they correspond to the fact that in the standard renormalization procedure, in addition to subtracting the divergent part uh, of the, of the uh, ultraviolet divergent terms, you can also subtract an arbitrary finite part of those terms. Um, and this is, yeah, taken to be um, a manifestation or, yeah, a manifestation of that fact, essentially. So the intuition was that renormalization could be reinterpreted as a fixing of ambiguities flowing from the causality condition rather than a subtraction of divergences. And this is where um, distribution theory comes into the into the picture, which would become a, set, a much more prominent feature in the, in the later mathematical physics development of um, this causal perturbation theory approach. Um, it, yeah, it seems that in attempting to kind of flesh out this understanding of renormalization, uh, this reinterpretation of renormalization, um, Stuckelberg and Bugalabov were led to incorporate distribution theoretic ideas. Um, yeah, so briefly, distribution, distributions are maps from, from test functions to the numbers. Uh, and the idea is that um, all ordinary functions can be associated with distributions, but we can also uh, identify distributions, uh, so-called singular distributions, which don't correspond to ordinary functions, such as the Dirac delta function. So it's kind of a generalization of the, the ordinary notion of a function. Um, and yeah, it turns out that quantum field theory propagators are actually singular distributions rather than, than ordinary functions. Um, and this means that the, the, uh, the, the time-ordered products that occur from second order in the perturbation series are products of singular distributions with overlapping singular support. Um, and that it's kind of like a general fact about uh, in distribution theory that, these, that the products of distributions, of singular distributions, aren't generally well-defined. Um, Stuckelberg and Bugalubov both suggested that the problem of ultraviolet divergences could be understood um, as, yeah, as essentially the need to provide a proper definition for these ill-defined um, products of singular distributions that occur in the perturbation series. And yeah, they both kind of have ideas about how this project of, of giving a proper definition to the ill-defined products should be carried out. Um, and claim that it is possible to give, uh, give a definition of these products, uh, a proper definition of these products, but it's not unique. Um, yeah, so Bugalabov has uses this like, this language of extension of um, the idea being we should start off with a space of test functions which, which vanishes at the at coincident points and then extend that space of test functions uh, in order to give a definition to these products. He, doesn't act, he, he kind of describes that as the way we should think about it, but then he actually ends up carrying out renormalization in essentially the conventional way, introducing a regulator and so on. So this isn't really brought to fruition, but it's kind of uh, introduced as an idea. Um, and Stuckelberg and Peterman in this 1953 paper, they actually try to, to do this essentially uh, in a slightly different way. They talk about the um, division, this kind of method of division um, in order to Give a, give, a, give a definition to the, the products of, of distributions in the perturbation series. Um, and they both claim that, that there should be, and that there should be, yeah, you, you can do this, but there's an ambiguity up to the addition of Dirac delta terms and its derivatives. So this is essentially providing a kind of mathematical realization of this initial intuition about non-uniqueness flowing from the causality condition. It can also be viewed as the non-uniqueness, the ambiguity coming from the fact that there just isn't a unique definition of these products of distributions occurring in the, in the perturbation series. 
So yeah, so essentially this, this basic picture which Stuckelberg and Bogolubov were sketching uh, turned out to be correct, uh, essentially. Um, but they, they weren't able to carry out the distribution theoretic analysis with full mathematical rigor, in part because the, the kind of pure mathematical tools needed just don't seem to have been there in the 1950s. And I think maybe, yeah, so Mike's going to be talking more about this later tradition in the causal perturbation theory approach as it was absorbed into mathematical physics. Yeah, so essentially, the Stuckelberg and Peterman had these ideas in the 1950s. Then there was kind of radio silence for 15 years or something. And then we have this paper by Epstein and Glazer, which um, brought this distribution theoretic um, uh, analysis of renormalization to, to fruition. Um, so yeah, so Stuckelberg and Peterman arguably, sorry, Stuckelberg and Bugelboff, um, their work kind of laid the groundwork for this, this um, treatment of perturbative quantum field theory in which uh, ultraviolet divergences, ultraviolet divergent expressions are never actually written down and manipulated. Um, hence the title of Scharf's uh, like modern textbook on this, on this approach, Finite Quantum Electrodynamics. So the, the attraction of this approach is supposed to be that yeah, we're never writing down ill-defined expressions. The mathematical rigor of the formalism is not in question. Uh, and this addresses at least one of the, um, the worries about the, about the conventional um, way of setting up perturbative quantum field theory and uh, carrying out renormalization. OK, so yeah, and I'll, I'll just finish by mentioning, uh, saying something about the, the renormalization group and how that fits into this story. Uh, so it seems that this, this reinterpretation of the, of the renormalization uh, of the problem of ultraviolet divergences um, played an, an important role in the, in the early development of the renormalization group, or at least played some role in the, in the, in the introduction of the idea of the renormalization group. Uh, Stockelberg and Peterman in this paper, which yeah, I mentioned before, um, which kind of introduced distribution theory uh, into, the, into the program, um, they were actually, they're often cited as kind of the this, is, this paper is often cited as being the origin of the notion of the renormalization group. They don't actually use the word renormalization because, yeah, Stuckelberg didn't like the word renormalization. He just used the word normalization, uh, I guess, because, yeah, if there are no infinities, then uh, <laughs> the, the word renormalization is a misnomer. Um, but, yeah, they define in this paper, the kind of point of the paper is. Um, uh, they, they go out, they, they set out to find, define a group of transformations between different ways of fixing these ambiguities in the terms of the, perturb in the perturbative expansion. Um, and this is what they call the, the renormalization group or the normalization group. Um, at this stage, the renormalization group, um, the, the Stuckelberg and Peterman's version of the renormalization group, they don't connect it with the scaling properties of the theory or any of the things which we associate with a re renormalization group today. It's really just a kind of um, formal paper um, establishing this transformation between different ways of fixing the ambiguity in the perturbation series. Yeah. So that, yeah, the objective seems to have been to view this, this freedom in the definition of the, um, of the terms in the perturbation series as somehow analogous to other symmetry groups of the S matrix. In 1954, uh, completely independently of this um, Stuckelberg and Peterman paper, uh, Gelman and Lowe introduced um, the, the renormalization group beta function uh, and used it to state some claims about the ultraviolet um, asymptotic behavior of QED. So they were really interested in the question of whether QED breaks down at arbitrarily high scales. This was, yeah, kind of an issue in the, in the 1950s. Um, there was this debate about the Landau poll and so on. Um, so that was the context of this paper. And yeah, again, Bogolubov uh, was picking up on this stuff uh, and wrote some papers um, yeah, in, the, in 55 and, and then a book in 57, which connected this Gelman and Lowe argument using the, the, um, the uh, beta function with Stuckelberg and Peterman's uh, group that they defined. Um, so the, the, the idea essentially is that um, uh, the Gelman and Lowe argument comes from the freedom of, um, uh, comes from the fact that we can impose renormalization conditions at different so-called renormalization scales, uh, and that's what they use to set up the, 
the beta function. Uh, and we can view transformations between different renormalization scales as kind of a subset of um, the transformations considered by Stuckelberg. And yeah, so it was actually Bugalabov, as far as I, yeah, so these papers in 1955 are the first time that the word renormalization group is written down, as far as I know. And this is the origin of the word, of the term renormalization group. Um, yeah, so this is, I think this needs to be looked into mm -hmm. further, but it appears that causal perturbation theory's emphasis on the ambiguities in the, in the, um, in the, uh, in the QFT perturbation series played some role in the emergence of the concept of the renormalization group. Uh, and in, yeah, in particular, the terminology the, of, of the use of the word group. The Gell-Mann and Lowe paper doesn't say anything about uh, a group. OK, so just to conclude um, this, this uh, last section on, the, on renormalization in, in the causal perturbation theory approach, uh, Stuckelberg and Bugalabov's reinterpretation of the ultraviolet divergences problem um, was maybe in retrospect a significant conceptual shift in renormalization theory. Yeah. Um, it's kind of difficult to tell. <laughs> well, so I, I, it's unclear whether their ideas had much impact at the time. Uh, and it's kind of still unclear to us how their ideas propagated into, into future work. Um, but they seem to have played some role in these later de in, in uh, developments in later decades, um, which are kind of much much more recognized as being very important for how we should understand renormalization. In particular, yeah, as I said, so they, they kind of laid the groundwork for this, this um, rigorous development of causal perturbation theory in the mathematical physics literature, which Mike's going to be talking about more, um, which is kind of essentially the dominant approach to understanding perturbative quantum field theory in mathematical physics. Um, and yeah, somehow they laid the seeds for the renormalization group. Um, the question of how this 1950s renormalization group relates to Wilson's renormalization group in the 70s, I think, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I want, <laughs> where I'm going with this, but I, I don't have any answers at the moment. So yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's the end. <laughs> Dave. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe this is one of the things that we were saying we still want to work on, but um, like, how should we think about what this means about the significance of scaling and the way that people see that, right? Is, is, is part of the moral here that at least in perturbation theory, scales just aren't as important as people have thought from the kind of like, uh, you know, from like the Wilson approach, or is it, is it that scales are coming in here in some place that that isn't immediately visible or something? I, yeah, I you comment on that. Mm. Well, so I think, yeah, you, the Gell-Mann and Lowe renormalization group. So yeah, the, the, an issue here is that the word renormalization group is being used to refer to lots of different things, which I think are like formally distinct. And that's one of the things, yeah, I'd like to write a paper that <laughs> distinguishes, goes through all the different things that people call the renormalization group and tries to clarify the relationships between them. Uh, yeah, so I think the Gell-Mann low renormalization group is connected to scaling. Um, um, yeah, I mean, apparently, yeah. So there, there are some, there are some, um, some papers actually in the kind of um, later causal perturbation theory tradition in mathematical physics that try and articulate the relationships between these different things. Uh, and apparently, yeah, they recognize, they, apparently the Stuckelberg renormalization group is like a recognized thing in this framework. And the Gell-Mann low group ends up being a semi-group, it's not a real group or something. And then they have a story about how the Wilsonian renormalization group relates to those two other groups as well. Uh, or to those other structures, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm not really answering your question, but yeah, essentially, I don't know. <laughs> and that's, yeah, that's kind of the big thing that I want to uh, work on at the moment, really. Um, yeah. Chris next? Yeah, I had 
two questions. One was about, so if you think about them as developing a kind of self-consistent conservative formula, hmm. looking at non-conservative questions in the form. I'm curious how they respond to nice and very good about all of those emergencies. You mean the, the fact that the series itself doesn't? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not. So I, I think um, they are both aware of that fact from 1952 onwards. Um, that seems to have affected... So I said Bogolubov was originally trying to, trying to construct a time evolution equation from the perturbation series. Mm -hmm. He seems to have given up on that, and I assume that's why, basically. It was, yeah, I think in these early papers he was like hoping that the perturbation series converged and you could use it to actually construct a time evolution equation. And then... Yeah, after those papers, the next one is in like 1955, and he's saying we should just start from the causality condition and never bother writing down a time evolution equation. So it's kind of a hypothesis, but I think maybe the, the, the fact that they've realized the perturbation series diverges was right. significant there. Um, yeah. Sorry, and the second question, which was just uh, um, in the jump from the, you know, 50s, which you're focusing on, up to 73. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly the development of the theory of distribution was an important part of what uh, yeah. Epstein and Glazer were uh, uh, using. Yeah. Was new. But do you have the sense that the people uh, in the 50s just had the feeling that there was mathematics they needed that they didn't have yet? And that, that was what was, you know, they say there's this ambiguity and how you find product, and not quite sure how to do it. Is that yeah. really like a felt? absence there, and then is that one of the reasons why some of this work was... Well, so, so, we've been, well, Mike's been looking at more, uh, kind of, of this. yeah, I think that's basically what Mike's going to be talking about, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it seems like a group, like, very disparate people were all kind of trying to use distribution theory to eliminate quantum field theory around this time. Uh, they weren't really talking to each other much, but yeah, it seems to have been kind of in the air uh, in this period. Um, in terms of, yeah, whether they were aware that they didn't have all the tools they needed yet, um, that would explain why Bogolubov doesn't actually do it. <laughs> so he kind of like, he, he gives these glosses on how we should understand renormalization in a distribution theoretic way, and then when he does calculations, he just introduces a cutoff and does it the standard way. Uh, so yeah, that would make sense of why he, yeah, which I didn't really understand. <laughs> uh, but it could be that he's just aware that he doesn't actually have all the machinery he needs to carry out things the way that he's saying that we should do it. Um, yeah. And I don't know whether Stuckelberg knew that he was being, <laughs> he was kind of, uh, writing down some potentially nonsensical things, but, um, yeah. Mike, you have a comment on this? Yeah, just on the first point, um, uh, I, I, don't, I haven't looked at the book of Leo, but in the Stickelberg Petterman, um, we know that they, they were aware of the large order divergence at this time because, um, the, so the Dyson argument comes out in 1952, um, but then the following year, well, 53 and 54, there's Beachman a wrote, uh, three papers where you get, rather than this kind of conceptual argument that Dyson mm -hmm. gives about the instability of the vacuum, um, the, there's three papers, one's Turing, I'm forgetting the third, mm -hmm. but the, but the um, one is also Petterman, um, where they're just calculate, they're not conclusive arguments, but they calculate mm -hmm. subcollections of graphs, and the conclusion is that absent some kind of miraculous cancellation in the, in the graphs that have been neglected, that you have to have um, they, they prove bounds that show that you have to have large order divergence. Mm -hmm. So Petterman, I'm pretty sure the Petterman paper on this is in 1953. So yeah, he's, they're sort of easily deeply. Gary, you have a comment on this? Uh, I'm just wondering whether causal approach has anything to say about, well, first of all, uh, non-normalizable theories, and second of all, about uh, gauge theories where there's a study of ghosts. Um. Yeah. Hmm. Basically, I don't know uh, the answer to that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about how... I've not seen any 
uh, treatment of non-renormalizable non theories in this framework, even in the like contemporary stuff, right? Do they? Okay. Uh, so yeah, maybe you should ask Mike Morris rather than me. Um, but definitely, yeah, Stuckelberg and Bukalabov definitely aren't uh, dealing with non-renormalizable theories. Um, in terms of the treatment of gauge theories, um, yeah, I think that's fairly well worked out. Uh, so yeah, so Scharf, Scharf has this book, Finite Quantum Electronics, Dynamics, and then he has another book, uh, I forget the title of the other one. Quantum like Gauge Theory is a True Ghost Story. A True story. Ghost Story, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so trying to, yeah, basically um, applying this framework to, to gauge theories. Um, so yeah, that's definitely that. Um, but yeah, sorry, I can't say anything more interesting about that. Yeah, it's F3 next in the queue. So there's an interesting um, interview with Wilson on the Victor mm. about mm. Is this the is this the um, physics of scale interview? Was it different? <coughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. It's, the, the thing. Um, uh, the interesting, one of the things that interests me about that interview is he disavows the name renormalization group methods. Mm. He says at one point he thinks it's probably a mistake yeah. to call the renormalization group methods precisely because he was picking up on the earlier terminology, but then he decides that that is uh, confusing. Yeah. Um, so I just wondered what you thought about that. I think that might be right, to be honest. Um, I, well, I think it's definitely. Wilson is definitely doing something quite different from what, like, Bukalabov is calling the renormalization group. Um, in terms of, yeah, and Wilson's, yeah, Wilson's not dealing with a group, basically. Like, <laughs> uh, so in that sense, it's, yeah, it's obviously yeah, a, a, a misnomer. Yeah, he, he, he says it's more, he thinks they're doing something different. But don't worry about that, that's a self-serving thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, um, yeah, I think I was going to say something else, which I've now forgotten. Um, um, but yeah, I, I really want to look at, so, so I, I did start looking at this, but I haven't looked at it in any detail, kind of. Wilson's beginnings with the renormalization group. I started reading his PhD thesis, and he's essentially trying to um, employ a Galman Low style argument to these kind of like non perturbative formulas which were being written down in like meson theories in the late 50s and stuff. Um, so he was kind of the origin, yeah, from the beginning, he was sort of because this is this is like intrinsically tied to perturbation theory, like. Uh, yeah, you can't, yeah, this notion of the renormalization group is an intrinsically perturbative one. And he was, from the beginning, it seems, trying to, like, move into an, in a non-perturbative direction with it, which I think, yeah, is maybe the beginning of how this became <laughs> so different from the, the earlier stuff. Um, but yeah, that's just my very brief <laughs> uh, beginnings of trying to... Um, really look into Wilson's development. Because I think, yeah, no one's really done that yet. Looked at kind of what he was actually doing in the 60s and uh, how that led into what became the, the, the famous works in the 70s. Um, yeah. Uh, Simone, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, so the decisive conceptual move seems to be to, to drop those terms that took up a long time, temporal time, right? Mm. Okay. And, um, and could you say a little more about the motivation for that? Because I mean, if you have a big expansion, so and then individual terms don't seem to make the right physical sense. So I mean, then just disregarding this terms is a relatively is a relatively bold move, right? I mean, the, there's no yeah. Obviously, there's a there's a physical there's a physical picture behind this um, uh, this idea that that. Um, well, so this is kind of 
I'm, I'm not sure if I completely understood your question, but if, if, is the worry that uh, it seems ad hoc. We're ad hoc because because the terms in the series don't correspond to real prices or something. Yeah. 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 So that that was kind of what I was flagging as uh, one of the problems with Stuckelberg's okay. version is that he he is kind of um, giving some kind of physical interpretation of the individual terms in the perturbation series as if they correspond to yeah. physical processes. Um, yeah, and I agree. I, yeah, find this dubious. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess that's kind of, at least the narrative of the, the way I was telling it, that's kind of one of the um, advances that Bogolovov made uh, because his version of the causality condition is, is an operative statement. Uh, so like... Um, Uh, yeah, this thing um, doesn't involve that kind of dubious uh, reading of the of the individual terms in the series as mm -hmm. as being as corresponding to physical processes. So yeah, in the the narrative as I was telling it, at least this is kind of like one of the reasons that Bogolovs had made progress over Schubelberg. Um, yeah. Um, I a, yeah. So, so um, a couple of things related to this and the discussion. I do have a little bit of, I guess, an issue with the name of causal perturbation theory in hmm. the sense of, like, well, from the uh, the first approach, though, obviously, it's what we were talking about. That makes no sense to make physical arguments about terms of pure expansion like that. Yeah. And in fact, I was moving. Some, if someone were to tell me, I'm going to remove the other one because. It's Create a particle after that and say, oh, yeah, you're just doing something wrong. You don't do that. That's mm -hmm. making sense. Um, the reason I don't like the word causal is because it suggests that something like a Dyson expansion would be a causal, which is not. Mm -hmm. By that I mean, like, if you make predictions, finite time uh, um, evolution using the Dyson expansion, uh, you're fine. Uh, all orders in perturbation theory, you do not violate causality in any mm -hmm. way. So I'm not happy with the name causal in the sense of it kind of suggests that the other ones is a causal. Yeah. And, and that's a that's a good one. Uh, oh, you want that? I have a second. Okay. I I was gonna, yeah. So maybe a better way of thinking about it is actually uh, that this this causality condition as the basis for deriving the perturbation series is like a more minimal assumption than. The time evolution equation. Right. So, so minimal I mean, perturbation theory might be like that makes sense <laughs> because the causality of the thing it goes back to the hyperbolicity of the equation that you start yeah. with. Yeah. And as an expansion, it is a mathematical way of solving that equation in a particular way. Yeah. I mean, so I guess the way you would justify it is, yeah, here you're you're only demanding causality and you're not making any further. Right. Uh, yeah. It's no, like a more minimal. That is very. But I, again, kind of when someone calls something causal. Yeah, yeah. You, my brain goes immediately as well. In contrast to the equals, yeah, 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 fair enough. The, the second, the second um, thing is like, well, that's interesting, right? Because uh, when people keep their eyes in S matrix and in scattering theory, right? Uh, I guess we will talk more about that in the discussion again. But um, uh, when they do, for example, quantum electrodynamics, they're doing perturbation theory, and the convergence of the series is not that it's doubtful. That we know it doesn't converge. Yeah. So we're talking about uh, an expansion that is divergent, mm -hmm. and we know that we're missing precisely because we're kind of missing terms that go like the exponential of one over the coupling, kind of terms, yeah. are not captured by any particular expansion. Yeah. Um, is this a causal approach uh, having the same kind of problems exactly? I mean, like, is the perturbative expansion based on this assumption um, just as limited as, as limited as? Yeah. Okay. So it's basic. It's not really. Um, so yeah, what Stuckelberg, because he was actually a kind of competitor of Feynman and Schwinger, like this was a competing program initially. Um, by the time Bogolubov's working in this framework, it's more kind of like um, he's trying to rationally reconstruct the standard approach. It's not really like a competing theory, which is going to have different properties. He's really just trying to give uh, like a conceptually superior reconstruction of the conventional uh, perturbative 
a perturbation series. So it, yeah, it has all the same <laughs> uh, issues as you as you mentioned. And this yeah, so this this framework is definitely not like um, a complete formulation of quantum field theory. Um, right. It doesn't even aspire to do that. You what? It doesn't even want to do that as an objective to formulate uh, because I kind of got maybe that's my wrong reading of that because I kind of got from some of the from the talk. But again, that could be me. That the idea is to build a quantum theory directly perturbatively. In a way I think that problem. was maybe the idea at the beginning. Like I think that's maybe what Schuckelberg was was hoping. Right. Um, but yeah, as I said, I think Bogolubov's fairly clear um, that this is like. Yeah, and the, in the later mathematical physics tradition follows follows that line of thinking of it's really more yes we know this is an incomplete uh, formalism but can we like can we make it make sense basically? Right, right. <laughs> it's kind of hopeless to try to formulate the full theory from a perturbative approach when you know the, the, the series series is not divergent. Yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah. So you you're. You're aware that all you're going to end up with is a, div a divergent series, right. but if we can at least like resolve some of the conceptual problems with the conventional way of setting up the perturbation series, that's progress of some yeah, kind. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You are next. Me? Um, no. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we heard about the refusion yesterday, uh, and it seems that many notions of Lorentzian QFG have Euclidean analogs. Can you say a little bit about? Causal, this causal approach in that context. Is there an analog that's maybe not physically meaningful? Or? A Euclidean analog of causal perturbation theory. Um, I assume you can do that, uh, but I don't really have any, yeah, I don't have much to say about it, I don't think. Um, yeah. Um, so maybe you would just designate an arbitrary coordinate as the time quote unquote coordinate and, and use that to order to order things. Hmm. I mean one thing so yeah, I I'm, I'm not really sure. But one thing to mention is that you can actually do um, you can actually send up set up non-relativistic quantum mechanics perturbation series in this way as well, which is kind of cool. So the the causal way of doing the the derivation of the of a perturb of the perturbative expansion also works for quantum mechanics. But in that case, um, yeah, you can the time evolution equation is well defined. There's no real problem with starting from the time evolution equation. Um, yeah, the way that Scharf sets it up in, in his textbook on this is like, yeah, he starts off with um, do, doing this kind of alternative derivation of the perturbation series in non relativistic quantum mechanics and then says this derivation generalizes the quantum field theory better than the standard way of trying to set up the perturbation series. Um, yeah, so that's kind of cool. No, um, so I was going to ask you what you thought about for the direction of time comes from in this causality condition. Right, so it seems like one option is it's purely conventional, take the time ordering and then set up your perturbation theory, ordering things by the, the later then relation. Mm -hmm. And it, it might turn out to be completely symmetric, so I could then alternatively set up a well defined perturbation theory by ordering things by the earlier then relation. And mm -hmm. those are like perfectly consistent. Or it might be something deeper, like there really is a kind of direction of time that you have to bring in to do perturbation theory. Like and then it really is important that it sort of the causal thing really is causation one direction at a time. Yeah. Huh. The I haven't thought about this. <laughs> so, you, so, well, so the reason I ask is because there's this new series of papers on uh, called dynamical like C star algebras that Buchholz and Greenhalgh are writing on. Mm -hmm. And they, they use the exact same causality condition. Yeah. And they think still... this is indicative of like a kind of privileged direction of time entering oh, into okay. kind of quantum mechanical formalism. Interesting. And I suspect that that's really too much into a, being too much into formalism. And yeah, I, I wouldn't, approach, but I wouldn't have yeah. thought that <laughs> was the case. Uh, but yeah, that's interesting that they're, um, yeah, because they're, the, 
I don't know much about, I mean, Mike knows more about um, the forward trajectory of this into mathematical physics, but yeah, my impression is that the, the Epstein laser um, stuff was kind of the foundation for what is now algebraic perturbative for QFT. Um, so yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I, I don't really know much about how they're interpreting these things. So yeah, that's interesting to know. But yeah, I don't have, I haven't thought about that. Yeah, I guess I had kind of a naive question. Um, I guess I was just confused with the idea that how we have particles kind of popping into existence out of nothing, how, how is that not a violation of cause, causality just as it is? Uh, if it's a vacuum and you have particles kind of appearing out of nothing, is that not also a violation of this causality? Or? Um. Yeah, I don't really. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't really know how to, what to say to that. Um, yeah. No, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I was just drawing a blank there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do have a comment. Let me say, like, um, um, can you, can you clarify a bit more what you mean by that, though? Because you see, when you have finite time interactions, you mind the following. If I have the what I call the vacuum state of the theory, right? That's a very non-local state. The vacuum is the ground state of a Hamiltonian that is defining the whole of space time. The whole, whole of space, if you frame. So if I do a localized measurement, it is localized in space and time. I'm definitely not in the ground state local to the observable that you're looking at. So two ways of looking at this. If you do if you do a measurement for an interaction, if you have an interaction that lasts a finite amount of time, you're gonna see excitations because you're not definitely measuring the an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian that you consider evolution with respect to. And the second one, when you have limits of integration or a switching function, you have a time-dependent Hamiltonian. So you can understand that as the switcher spending some energy in order to do this, and you can get uh, excitations out of a ground ground state, ground state of the system that interacts in the ground state of the theory. Therefore, uh, it's not violation of causality of any kind. You're just uh, measuring the ground state and getting excitations out of that. It's not bad. You can have issue of where the energy comes from. Is that an open system? But not about causality, I would say. It's not a causal. You know the one? might be semantics. That, that the causation is because of the, you are either putting energy in the system, you have a time dependent Hamiltonian. Or, well, in a way, you are probing um, an observable, in which you, you know, start with from an eigenstate of the observable, so you will have dynamics. Okay. Anyway, sorry. It's, uh, that's no, not thanks. No problem. <laughs> yeah, Laura. Thanks. Uh, this is like, I like being worried by Hack's theorem. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like there's the Newtonian interaction picture where it's an embarrassing as an evolution equation where Hack's theorem tells us there's no Hilbert space to evolve through. Yeah. Um, and this eliminates that embarrassment, but you're still calculating transition probabilities between in states and out states that live in the free Hilbert space yeah. using this object, the international, that international interaction Hamiltonian. That's not defined by that Hilbert space if it's defined by the Hilbert space at all, Hack's theorem tells us. Is that really that much of an improvement? Possibly not. Possibly not. Um, yeah, I definitely don't think it helps with um, it. It doesn't. Yeah, it's not like um, it doesn't help with the problem of relating the perturbative approach to a consistent non-perturbative picture. I don't think. Um, I mean. It depends on how you, how, yeah, how you think that the conventional approach, the conventional derivation of the perturbation series is really employing, like whether it's actually directly using inconsistent assumptions or something like that, then maybe this is an improvement. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't like solve the big problem with Hogg's theorem of like, um, Relating um, the perturbative framework to like an exact non-perturbative framework, which is um, 
describing finite times. Yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, the way that I said that they, they were kind of trying to describe um, finite time scattering, but ultimately, the way they're doing it is pretty kind of artificial and formal, I would say. Um, yeah, because you're essentially just, you get finite times, uh, finite, you're really just dealing with asymptotic states and turning the interaction on in just some finite region. So it's not really a description of finite times. It's like some kind of, again, some kind of idealized um, formalism for trying to describe finite times. But yeah, yeah, I'm not sure how much of an improvement it is. I mainly just wanted to, yeah, I wanted to know what other, <laughs> what uh, people who know, yeah, who thought about this more would think about, uh, about this and whether it, it addresses any of those worries or not. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm not seeing any other hands up. Did I miss anybody? Okay, let's thank our speaker. Mm -hmm.